I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today is Howard Klein, founder of RK Equity. Howard, thank you so much for being with us again. Thanks for having me, Priscilla. All right, so to start, I wanted to ask you, I know the last time we spoke was in June, if you could talk a little bit about what were the main trends you saw in the second half of the year, and if anything disappointed you in the lithium space, were there some things that you were expecting will happen that didn't happen? We didn't get a trade resolution, which uh, I def definitely thought look was likely, you know, in May. And I think that uh, overhang has affected commodity markets globally. It's definitely affect affected Chinese uh, GDP, which has slowed dramatically. Uh, Chinese um, car sales, you know, EV sales in particular. Um, yes, there was a subsidy change, but the decline uh, in October and, and the preceding three months as well have just been uh, surprisingly negative in China. So. That was, uh, I guess, a big disappointment since June um, and has negatively affected uh, the market. Um, I also, so on the demand side, I think things were worse, but also on the supply side, SQM changed in the first quarter. They said they weren't so concerned about market share. They were focused on margins, but they have implemented a plan and they've reiterated it today at the benchmark conference that you know they used to have 30% market share, now they're at 20% market share. So they're very aggressively selling low quality product, uh, or technical grade product into the Chinese market in particular. And that is causing you know uh, s uh, prices in the Chinese market to have accelerated its decline and um, is uh, causing a lot of pain, I think, in particular to the Western Australian, you know, spodumene producers. So those were, um, you know, I guess, disappointments and, and surprises. All right, and um, as you're mentioning, uh, decline in prices, it seems investors are waiting on the sidelines to see uh, if we're at the bottom yet. What are your thoughts? Um, how long are we gonna stay here? And what do you think will happen next year in the lithium market? I'm going to be cautious at predicting timing because I've not been successful in that uh, before. And like I, I, I do still hope that we'll have a, uh, a trade or phase one, you know, plan um, or, or, or a trade resolution um, in December. But you know, news flow is is mixed on on that uh, right now. But um, the the sentiment is poor. Um, the institutional investors in New York and elsewhere are just, you know, they're on to other things. The broader market is doing well in the United States, and there has been some rotation uh, in emerging markets. And so we're in a little bit of a risk on, in, you know, in the past two or three months compared to the summer, but it's not been affecting the um, lithium market. What's interesting, I listened to the Albemarle and, and Live End conference calls. This time last year, they were optimistic going into their year-end pricing negotiations, and this year they've been articulating uh, negative sentiment toward that because all of their customers are kind of looking at the Chinese price, you know, technical carbonate price, and they're trying to get cheaper, um, you know, battery grade prices. Uh, and their buyers want lower prices, obviously, because they're trying to get the battery costs down, et cetera. So um, I don't know. I, I, I felt this time last year that we'd have a pretty good first quarter. And then you had all of these disappointments, starting with Aura Cobre uh, in December of last year. So maybe their pessimism will be reversed, you know, this year, and it won't be as bad. A lot is priced in, um, I think, from a lithium pricing perspective, but not everything is necessarily priced in from a sovereign risk perspective, because you saw um, SQM fall a lot yesterday, which wasn't lithium-specific news, it was Chile-specific news, and, and Albemarle fell as well. So it's very difficult to call a turn, but I am where, where I have optimism and where I am focused and looking is uh, Ganfeng in particular. Um, China, I think, is a leading indicator, and uh, Ganfeng is benefiting from lower spodumene prices, and they're increasingly exporting to Korea and Japan um, a, 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 you know, battery grade you know, premium price. So I think a lot of bad news was priced into that stock, but that stock is you know, at a 52-week high or near 52 weeks high. So that's kind of cause for optimism. They're, they don't speak to the market very much. They don't have conference calls, so you have to you know, look at their when they do you know, publish. They're reasonably transparent when they do publish, but it's like not very frequent. And, um, but uh, I take that as a, I'm looking at Ganfeng um, you know, optimistically. Where you know, Livens in Argentina, there's still Argentina. There's like the companies that I like, nevertheless, have um, issues, you know, independent of their uh, you know lithium business that that 
it, it, it's it's it's, it's still a difficult time to, to call the bottom. I mean, it's still, it's important, I think, still to have exposure. It's also important to have, you know, reasonable amount of cash um, to try to, you know, average down or find, you know, bottoms. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. The, the, I'm optimistic from Tesla's profits. I'm optimistic from what I see in Volkswagen and, um, you know, the Gigafactory in Shanghai is gonna start selling and, uh, you know, Volkswagen is opened in Chattanooga, Tennessee, or has just started construction there. So the, the, the commitment and everything I'm hearing from cathode makers and battery makers, uh, you know, battery grade demand is, is definitely there. And I still believe we're, and I am in the camp that a, a shortage potentially sooner uh, of battery grade hydroxide, for example, is uh, it could happen sooner than people expect, but how soon? I don't know. Maybe second half of next year, maybe 2021. And when does the market kind of pr start pricing that in? You know, I, I don't know. Still very optimistic, the thematic, but there's clearly um, complications, you know, affecting the stocks and the valuation of the stocks which uh, have been derated, uh, you know, from 10 or 12 times EV to EBITDA in some cases, you know, to, to a lot lower. But you've also had execution, you know, issues at some of the companies. So Tang Shi was over budget, you know, Albemarle's performance on and the cost overruns, et cetera, are, 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 you know, eat into profit as well. So um, I don't know when the bottom is, but uh, still very optimistic, but you got to pick, pick your spots. All right. And um, one of the recent news we heard actually yesterday was um, about investments. We heard Palingurst and Traxxas committing $2 billion um, into battery metal projects. I wanted to ask you, what do you think is going to be challenging for them when picking and choosing lithium projects specifically? Well, I know Palinhurst reasonably well, and I know Traxxas reasonably well. I've been talking to them about a lot of lithium projects for a long time. And Traxxas is a trader, um, and not they invest, but not you know a lot. So Palinhurst is a private equity, very much focused on equity, not focused on debt. So when they came into Namaska, I've been a big supporter of hoping you know that that deal and, and that project will get going and that investment will be made. But the concept of a traditional mining private equity group having done the work and started drinking the Kool-Aid, you know, for the battery materials and see, you know, an opportunity to deploy capital and their expertise as, as very positive. Um, what are the challenges? Um, I think they're spoiled for choice. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a lot of you know, very interesting, you know, opportunities in North America and, and, and Europe um, and Australasia, you know, that they said. So they've been examining this for like a long time. And I think they can do very, very well. Um, so I'm excited by their entry. And I would hope that there would be many more traditional private equity funds like a a resource capital or Appian or some of these funds that um, EMR, you know, that, that developed over the last kind of five or eight years have not played in lithium, and I hope they do, or we find some, you know, alternative money um, that, uh, you know, that come into the space. But it's a very positive sign, but we need um, a 10 of them. All right. So for the investors that are watching us today, uh, you've been investing in the space for a while. I just wanted to ask you, considering the current market conditions and what you expect will happen in, in 2020, um, how should investors approach this season? What is your strategy right now? I think there's a lot of good opportunities. Um, I think the best opportunities for uh, again, I, I work with a lot of uh, earlier stage companies, and I think we've been through now two up and down cycles, like in 2009-10, I call that lithium 1.0, you know, the 2016-17 period, I'm calling, you know, lithium 2.0. I think we're, we're, we will bottom in lithium 2.0, and then kind of lithium 3.0 um, will, will start. And in each of those time periods, you know, investments were made and, and were fashionable, and, and, but also things you know, have, have evolved. So the rush to Argentina in the last bit, I know you're Argentine, so forgive me, um, but I just think that 
you know, Lack got funded and Kachari Olaraz and, and Liven's uh, investing and Oracobre's investing, but I just think as a, from a sovereign risk perspective and also from a technical, you know, consideration perspective, Argentina is going to be a bit more challenged. Um, and, but also investments have been made into kind of direct lithium extraction technologies and new technologies and Ganfeng's going into, you know, uh, clay. And so I think new uh, technologies will, you um, uh, garner some interest. So I have E3 Metals is one which attracted investment from Livent. You know, Standard Lithium is uh, connected to Langsness, and even you know Schlumberger invested in, in Pure Energy. So it just shows that there's other alternative money, strategic money, going into kind of new technologies. Sustainability is a, is a very you know key element. Um, but I still think you know conventional projects like in North Carolina Piedmont we talked about in the past. You know, I see this kind of Carolina to Quebec, you know, hydroxide hub. It kind of makes sense to, from a sustainability point of view, there's also that there's been a rush to Western Australia because in Lithium 1.0, a lot of those companies, they were the most advanced and they were the quickest to potentially get into production. But uh, with high um, CapEx and cost overruns and higher OpEx than expected, and then they're not close to cathode or battery, you know, manufacturing. So in the interest level of... Um, ex-China, um, you know, processing from a security point of view, I think you'll start seeing, uh, you know, I'm looking at European opportunities, I'm looking at North American opportunities, there's lots and lots of North American opportunities from, from plain vanilla hard rock to, uh, you know, Ioneer, um, which also has an interesting boron, and Rio Tinto is, is looking at the tailings project over there, again, but clay, direct lithium extraction, you know, so Canada, U.S., I think, if we're talking about a 2030 market, like you're talking about the next 10 years, instead of looking, we're now going to be 2020, so we should stop talking about 2025 and start looking at 2030. And that 2030 number is going from 1 million to 2 million. So where's that extra million going to come from? I don't, uh, there's no reason that North America can't be 10, 20% of that supply, in my opinion, right? There's enough projects there. And if that's the case, that's, you know, 20% would be, you know, 400,000 tons, you know, up from zero almost zero right so uh, i'm focused a lot on that and i see a lot of opportunity there all right howard my last question for you today and i'm asking this to everyone here at the conference um considering what you're expecting will happen in the 2020 decade if you had to define that in one word what would it be and why i'd use the word velocity the speed with which you know th these markets move down and up, it's probably going to continue. Much as I'd like it to be kind of sustained, I, I, I think it's going to be a function of these markets. It's going to be boom bust. All right, Howard, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right, once again, I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today is Howard Klein, founder of RK Equity. <laughs>